What is hip hop and happening, gamers? Welcome back to the Super Show podcast, episode number 205. And what a doozy of a show we have for you this week. I'm your host. My name is Jamie. And joining me is a man who I have it on good authority couldn't complete the Stella Blade demo because he had to stop every two minutes to jerk it, Mr. Alex Jones. How much, on a scale of zero to Pepper Army, how red raw is it right now? Uh, spicy Pepper Army. The, the, the spicy, oh. the, red, the red guy. Yeah, I figured as much. And apparently the same kind of, same kind of texture. Um, well, like a broken mouth. One. Like, one you, like one you've had in your packed lunchbox all day and you forgot about on your trip to Centre Parks and then it got really hot and then you sat on the packed lunchbox and it got all mangled. You know what, this is great material if you ever do, and touch wood, you know, this isn't the case, but if you ever need to write yourself a dating profile in the future for any reasons, you've just come up with a perfect description for for your member. In fact, we were talking, full transparency, we are talking about mine uh, just before we went live, and about the fact that mine is currently grey and has a distinct (laughs) odour. Jonesy tells me these are both things I should be worried about, right? That's because you finished the uh, the demo of Stella Blade. That's why. <laughs> yes, um, we will be talking about that demo and giving our impressions on the game that has the internet up in rapturous, uh, fiendish conversation. Is Stella Blade the game not just to save video games in general, but the game to save all of Western civilization with its jiggle physics? Um, we will let you know in just a short while but that's not all we're going to be talking about because we've also going to be breaking down that reveal trailer we got for marvel rivals a 6v6 team shooter that looks suspiciously like a formerly 6v6 team shooter that you may have played in the past and of course as gdc kind of wrapped up in the past week we're still going to be picking apart the final bits and pieces and quotes and interviews that came from that in particular we're going to be looking at some of the comments that Phil Spencer made, I believe, in an interview with Polygon, question mark, where he was talking about all kinds of brave new horizons, like the possibility of other digital storefronts, like the Epic Game Store, being on an Xbox in the future, as well as whether or not Gen Z consumer behavior could be one of the reasons Xbox are taking this bold new uh, direction when it comes to exclusivity. And we're going to wrap things up by talking about not w- well by talking about what we've been playing over the past few years, but on the way that we usually do, in more of an actual statistically led, survey driven way. Because it turns out a lot of you motherfuckers like to play really old games. Um, more on that later. Before though, Jonesy, we get into this thing they call a podcast. I just want to ask you how you are. How's life? Uh, yeah, not too bad, mate. Not too bad. I've I've managed to play some stuff uh, in the last week, which is always nice. So that's good. And watch some stuff, and just generally yeah. do some stuff. So um, yeah, not not so bad. It's, it's exciting. I've got to be honest. We have a little podcast document we we write in just so we can keep tabs on all the uh, notes we want to hit over the coming hours. And when I saw that you had also played the Cellar Blade demo, I was excited. I feel like there's a good discussion to be had there, um, as well as, as I hinted at earlier, maybe a discussion to be had about some of the um, the discourse around that game. And if you want to join in on any of that discourse, then you can do so. If you're watching on YouTube, you can maybe uh, leave a comment in the comment section, but you might also be watching us live on YouTube right now, in which case, hello, feel free to join in in the chat. We're probably going to give a shout out to some of you lurkers a bit later on. But of course, if you don't want to watch this podcast in any way, shape or form, then just just listen to it. You can head to any of the major podcasting platforms like Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts. You can stream it. You can download it and listen to it later. You can put it on your your car while you commute to work. I know there are people out there that do that. I hope you don't have any loved ones in the car when you started this episode. (laughs) I apologize for how quickly we talked about the physical descriptions of our penises. Um, Jonesy, talking about physical descriptions of penises... um, that's actually not, I don't have a segue for that. I, just, I wanted that to be the segue, but I don't have anything. Um, no, I, let me think of something actually here. Um, my pubic region has been described as look, looking a bit like Groot when it comes to the need um, for a trim and for just keeping things under control. Yeah, exactly. Um, and speaking of Groot, he will be featuring in an upcoming video game because this past week we finally got eyes on a game that was rumoured for a little while. It's Marvel Rivals. 
a game that is really hard to not call Marvel's rivals. Yes. Um, but it is most most definitely Marvel singular rivals, which is a six v six six team shooter from Call of Duty and Battlefield devs. But it is of course being handled by the fine folks over at NetEase, an internal team just referred to as NetEase Games at the moment. Um, they, Jonesy, have put together a team that is, quote, composed of global talent who previously worked on, as I mentioned, hit franchises like Call of Duty and Battlefield. But let's be honest. We saw the press releases. We heard the blurb. We read the back of the box, so to speak. And we all went into this trailer with open minds. And I don't know what we expected to see when you go into a trailer for a free-to-play 6v6 team-based game. Um, but what we got if you hadn't noticed from the title and the thumbnail of this podcast, was pretty reminiscent of some other things that we might have played in the past. Uh, yeah, it was utterly ridiculous. Like, I, I saw... Um, I'm not even going to, like, cloak and dagger this or say allegedly or, or I've seen. Like, I, I watched that trailer. Um, and, do you know what's... Okay, let's start off. If, if all things being equal, if this was not linked to anything else, if we weren't talking about this being like another game, I would think, yep. oh wow, this looks so cool. Like, really looks like a fun concept. I love what okay. Marvel have done. But now let's actually break it down and say this is Overwatch. This is third person Overwatch, where I, the fact that they've said they've got people that, you know, worked on other hit franchises, if they do not have at least 45% of their team um, who used to work uh, for Overwatch, for Blizzard, like, yeah. I would, I would. I'd be absolutely gobsmacked because this isn't like that they this isn't like they've um, they've watched loads of Overwatch stuff and then they've you know iterated upon that and come up with their own concept. There are things in this which look like they're just reskins. I think one of the things that hit me straight up was um uh you can play as Black Panther and he has yes. um a special whereby he can launch a big ethereal purple panther out of himself which sort of leaps and goes down the road just like um oh I can't remember his name just like the dude for, uh, who launches the dragon out of himself in Overwatch oh, like one of the Asian dudes one's called Genji and the not, other's called It's not Genji it's the other one uh no I was about to call him like Hattori Hands. I'm worried the further we take <laughs> this the more racist it gets let's, uh, let's let's roll it back to before I even identified them as Asian. I I'll look it up while we're talking about it. But yeah, it's it's and it's, no, it is Hanzo. It is Hanzo. It is ha is it Hanzo? It's not Hattori oh, yeah, Hanzo, um, but it is Hanzo. It's not Hattori Hanzo. Genji, uh, uh, there are probably some Overwatch fans who are fucking rolling in their graves right now, and they're not even dead. Um, Genji was the one who kind of wore like the almost like the full body suit. Um, the and ninja the sword, guy, yeah, yeah. And, and he threw the 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 shuriken almost. Yes, and had and Hanzo was the archer. Yes, but he had the spec. But the special from that, like you know, if you watch the trailer for Marvel Rivals, it is black. It, to me, it just looks like Black Panther special. It's, it's like a. It's obviously a different thing. It's like being in Harry Potter and having a different. Um, Ah, oh, I was going to just riff that off them, but I can't remember what it's called. The thing where you go, um, uh, it's, it's Patronum, uh, your Patronum, where they let this uh, big animal was, come out of themselves. I was going to say Wingardium Leviosa, I was way off. You're way off. Um, but then there's also another character that just looks like Tracer. Um, yep. I, it, like it's this is the thing there are so many characters who look almost I just identical there are some which don't like i'll give you like spider-man um hulk is effectively just a reskin of winston like there's there's it's so it's bizarre man it's so bizarre yeah and, but they've been you but know fine you if that's already. cool if you're allowed to if it, if, well, if it's, you've signed deals and paid money in grease palms i'm looking forward to it but the, someone's gonna get sued aren't they yeah see i don't think so like i i don't think Overwatch can trademark or copyright or patent any part of that process that stops games that are remarkably similar looking happening. And I, I also think that there are, and you mentioned a lot of them, that there are things that are going to make Marvel Rivals seem uh, different. You talked about that third person perspective. Don't get me wrong. I, I think that's that sort of ha helps with two criteria. One, because you don't want to license all the Marvel characters and all the skins they're probably going to find a way to sell and not have people see them. Then again, I said that about Indiana Jones, and I was totally wrong. Kind of, well, mostly right. wrong. Um, and and the other thing is because um, a large amount of the lineup of characters that we are going to look forward to will presumably have a melee-focused move set, whereas which might f help differentiate this game slightly from Overwatch, where if Overwatch's roster is primarily shooters and uh, like and Mar Rivals' lineup is mostly melee characters, maybe that ends up feeling different. So far, we've had playable characters confirmed. Like you mentioned, Black Panther. We've got Doctor Strange, Groot, um, Hulk is in there. 
Iron Man is in there, Loki. There's some people I don't know to, or either quite as well or at all, like Luna Snow and Magic with a K. Uh, Magneto's yep. in there. Penny Parker's in there. Rocket Raccoon, Spider-Man. Um, and one of the other things, well, let's say two of the other things that they're pushing as sort of potential differentiators to Overwatch, and let's see how these uh, tickle your pickle. One of them is sort of synergies between characters. We saw Rocket uh, riding on Groot's back at one point, and there was also a suggestion that Hulk was seen to be charging Iron Man's armor with some gamma energy. Um, so potentially using the links between these characters that exist in the comic book world and bringing that into Rivals. And the other thing was destructible environments. The idea that um, as the game progresses, the environments will become more destructible and these various hero superpowers will be able to break down buildings and reshape terrain and, and so on and so forth. And apparently it will have strategic impact on the game. Does any of that do enough for you? To, I'm not going to try and change your mind that this looks extremely similar to Overwatch. They, 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 that's very much intentional. But I mean, you sound like you're still on board. See, those elements you said about, they to me make all the difference in the world. Because I think when you, um, we've talked about this before, I think it's not necessarily the game you put out, it's what the players do with it. Um, and it's how yep. they find their own fun and how they, and this is why I think often with games, um, what the way they when they don't work is when players are sort of too too uh, constrained in how they're going to play, and often it is the fact that players can find their own way of doing things, and then they then that's where the meta takes off, and this is how you do it, and this is how you play, and da, 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 da. and that's what makes a really good like online game and keeps people coming back. And I think that having um, these you know, characters that can work together, destructible scenery, I think it, it that is where people will be able to find something new outside of like an Overwatch clone, which is why I think. I still think this game's got massive potential, um, especially mm -hmm. given how uh, you know how little they did with Overwatch Two, and they effectively released the same game with a bit of an update, a bit of a reskin, and a couple of new maps. And they said, "Hey, new game," uh, and people weren't buying it. I think this yep. is um, this could soak up a lot of people that were like looking for something a bit different with Overwatch, and actually could make it you know could become the new Overwatch. So it could be a really smart move. Uh, really smart move for them obviously the one thing they're going to problem they're going to have is the execution if it doesn't like overwatch felt phenomenal when you played it, it was a fantastic yes. um fantastic arena arena shooter um a, you know 6v6 game just because this is the same in concept doesn't mean it's going to feel as good and just because it is like looks like a reskin doesn't mean they will have nailed the mechanics the traversal the way those characters move about um so there's still everything to play for but on the face of it uh yeah like the, the second they said uh free to play 6v6 i'm like yeah of course well, who would not give this a go yeah yeah and it, it, you know, it's interesting you bring up sort of maybe some of the ways in which overwatch has struggled of late indeed with, with the sort of the reception to overwatch 2 and um from what i understand again neither of us are super well qualified to talk about kind of the state of overwatch as it were but i did go out of my way to seek out a podcast where an active overwatch player described you know some of the disdain they felt um for the current overwatch experience even as they were playing it almost on a daily basis and they felt as though it actually as you suggested it did create a window for something even very similar to come along and what they were hoping for was something that would recapture some of the early Overwatch magic. Well, one thing it felt, and again, I don't know if this has felt a lot through you know, the Overwatch player base, but there were still a lot of people who almost pined for, and maybe this is just nostalgia, but like the heyday of Overwatch. There were even references to this idea of the Overwatch beta as this like golden period where Overwatch was new and it was fresh and it was interesting and it felt amazing and everyone was excited and there were no overpowered or as yet undiscovered overpowered characters or, me or weird metas that people didn't like and everything was just fresh and new and Marvel's Rivals I've done it oh, don't you? Oh, we have to create like a swear jar for Marvel's Rivals Marvel Rivals um, kind of has that going for it. It, it it can kind of swoop in and be like hey remember when Overwatch used to be 6v6 well now this is 6v6 um, with the added um, bonus of just immediate immediate recognizability and this will be another thing i was going to ask you about is that like i i don't know about you but sometimes i watch overwatch from a distance and when it comes to the heroes that they've added to that that lineup to that roster sometimes their design or something about their aesthetic catches my eye and i'm like 
oh well cool that's like that's like a hamster in a ball i get it and i'm like and i can get it but then sometimes they add someone a little bit more generic who might play an important role within the context of the meta or what overwatch was lacking at the time but i'm as an outsider i'm like that's just a dude called roger and he might be the best support in the game but to me he's a dude called roger when you get into your know, bed with an ip like this every new character drop and every new uh, arena or location drop every you know it can mean something to a lot of people yeah massively um I th you've got a lot more i suppose at the same time as it being you know that you've got a lot more you can do with each character and people already know a character you also may be a little bit tied down to you know doing a certain thing with certain characters but marvel have so many characters i'm sure they can it's sort of, they can effectively put whatever they want into the game while still having it characters like a lot of people will know and love and will probably want to play as which obviously overwatch can't do that because they're always new characters they're always novel but yeah I, I'm, I'm with you i think a lot of the characters that overwatch introduce now or you know the, the most recent ones have probably tried to fill a gap but the problem is when you when you have a game that's been around for as long as Overwatch has, um, it's effectively like diminishing returns. Everything you do is going to, it's not going to pull in more people. It's effectively doing a little bit for a few people. Whereas I think obviously something like a Marvel Rivals, it, immediately, you've, I mean, just with those names you read out, like Iron Man, Hulk, um, you know, Spider-Man, Rocket Raccoon, you, these are massive names that all are going to pull people in straight away. Like you said, if someone says, hey, look, we've just added Frank to um, Overwatch 2, like you said, no one cares. Whereas you can just say a couple of names from uh, Marvel Rivals and suddenly it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to give this a go. Like The, the only thing that's going to be a limit to this game when it launches is how many platforms it's on. Um, and I think it, it'll do. It will have a massive start. It will really go and it will, you know, jump off a high board, but then... It all comes down to how is it second to second? How is it match to match? And that's where it's going to like live and breathe, I suppose. But um, yeah, I, it could yeah. eat, eat Overwatch 2's lunch, whatever lunch it has remaining at this point. Um, yeah, we'll have to see. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see like how Overwatch is able to respond to this as a game and how the Overwatch community responds to something like this. But also, yeah, how many other people are kind of left to be swept up because the other thing that will absolutely help Marvel's rivals out of the gate is the fact that it is going to be free to play. I think even like, o Overwatch, you know, a, a launch wasn't free to play. If I, I believe I'm right in saying, certainly on consoles, I think you needed to buy at least some version of the game. I think it, was, it wasn't full price by any means, but um, it wasn't free to play. One thing that isn't interesting, as you mentioned platforms, from what I understand, the only confirmed platforms at the moment are... are uh, Windows and Mac OS uh, releasing via Steam and Epic Games. Now, NetEase have said that they are, quote, actively exploring potential releases on other platforms. It seems like an inevitability, but as a sort of console-first gamer yourself, um, any p disappointment at the potential uh, or the, 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 the fact that a PS5, for example, version of this game might be later down the line? not really like as long as it comes i'm i'm fine with it like it's not something i would look to play on steam just because this is the sort of game that i i think is fantastic on console um that's where i'm going to want to play it that's where i'm going to have the most fun i probably wouldn't you know um uh go mouse and keyboard for a game like this i mean you easily could of course and i'm sure most there'll be loads of people are in our audience who are like oh how gross that you'd want to play it on console but um for me i think mm -hmm. it's uh i just i just find these kind of like you know, uh, colourful, overly saturated, high octane, fun shooters. I think they're they're a lot more fun on console. Sitting back on my sofa and watching watching them on a big screen with a um, with a wicked sound surround sound system. So I think I'll. But I, I hey, I'm I'm assuming it's coming, even if they haven't announced it. Like a few months after the fact, they're they're just I mean, they're just waiting for a check to be signed. Come on, man. Yeah, I like the game would have to be a calamity out of the gate for those console versions to not come eventually, and that. Um, it doesn't seem hugely likely. I mean, we haven't seen a huge amount of uh, NetEase's kind of offerings that are targeting Western audiences a little bit more than, than Eastern audiences, but those games are coming, and NetEase have been putting a lot of money into new studios and kind of swooping up a lot of, um, of, of talent uh, from other uh, major franchises, such as the talent that they put together for, for this team by the sound of things. I will say, Jonesy, I'm looking at another article here that adds a couple of other names to the list of characters that have been announced thus far that we didn't even mention. Uh, big names like Star-Lord in there, Punisher is in there, Scarlet Witch, all of which leads me to ask, um, 
And, you know, this is a decision you have to make sooner rather than later because there is a closed alpha test that actually starts next month. Oh. Who are you maining in Marvel Rivals? Do you know what? I, I would I would love to main Star-Lord at first for a little bit. So, I, do you know what? Okay, this is completely um, by accident. I'm actually rocking. You might not be able to see it. I'm still rocking my Soldier 76 Overwatch oh, yeah, t-shirt. Um, and okay. I feel like uh, Star-Lord is... If anyone's going to be, you know, the uh, Soldier 76 reskin, it's probably going to be someone like Star-Lord. He even has the face... Soldier 76 even has the face mask. Like, come on now. <laughs> He does. You're like, right. This is this is this um, is a bit ridiculous. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll go Star Lord. Star Lord uh, early on. Um, it's funny because then immediately I'm just like trying to think of what other characters are going to be. So so for example, like Doctor Strange is going to be. I can't remember who's the magic one who used to float around with his legs crossed doing the magic. Like Benyatta. Um, yes. Yeah. I see. I'm no not going anywhere the near one that. that. Will throw the orbs. Yes. Um, I'm not not going yeah. anywhere near him. Uh, that's yeah. going to be Doctor Strange. I, um, I, did, I did think, I don't know if it's just because he's dark and edgy and, and borderline suicidal all the time, but when I said Punisher, the first thought that came into my head was Reaper for some reason. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's a great shout. Yes. Um, I, I used to like playing as Mercy quite a bit uh, as, as a... Um, uh, healing people as up, a support, you know, a bit of support, yeah, yeah. A bit of support. Absolutely. So whoever, they, whoever their equivalent of that will be, I'm not sure who that will be. Um, in chat, actually, we had... Um, uh, someone point out actually quite very apt that Penny Parker is basically just diva, <laughs> which is like yeah, oh right, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I wasn't sure if this was speculation or, con or or something that people had seen or knew for themselves, but I remember there being some speculation when this game because on the day that the trailer came out, in the hours preceding it, the um, I think it was someone who had been like a uh, an alpha tester or someone who participated in some kind of closed testing for the game started leaking shit. And there was an, an allusion at one point to Hulk potentially being a diva-like character, in oh. so much as that you're Hulk in when you're in the mech, yeah. but you're Banner when you're not. Oh, that sounds that actually sounds wicked. Like if they if they you can if you can be about to be killed and then you can become Hulk right in front of someone and then just destroy them, that'd actually be quite cool. Yeah, I don't, again, I don't know if that was a thing. I don't know if that was fan fiction or speculation or what, but um, I did read that somewhere. Um, if it is just an idea, then then it's not a bad one. Um, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I'm 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 curious to see how many of these characters play because he, you know I'm, I'm don't get me wrong. I'm sure when you've got everything Marvel related to work with and you go in with a list of I believe it's 18, then you've probably chosen pretty carefully based on the kind of game experience you're trying to create and the kind of characters that facilitate that. And yet I'm still kind of looking at this. And I'm like, okay. I know what purpose Storm serves in the context of X-Men. Mm. I don't know how fun playing Storm will be in a game like that, like until I've got my hands on it. Um, and it's the same with, like, like you talk about Scarlet Witch and things. Like, there, are, there are enough, like, I, do, I, I generically perform magic tricks with <laughs> characters in there that I'm like, okay, how are you going to differentiate? I like Spider-Man, like, I, how... how that was always the big thing with Marvel's Avengers was, and uh, uh, people are going to laugh that we're talking about that game again, but I remember before Spider-Man came out, I played as some of those other characters and saw how they traversed and saw, you know, you know whether it's um, Black Widow's grappling hook or Captain America's double jump, and I'm like, you're going to put a motherfucker that swings in this game? I don't believe you. Um, and we saw how that touched. So yeah, I just want to see how all these things coalesce is what I'm fascinated by, because it's a lot of different heroes with a lot of different attributes to wrangle in a game where you know balance is going to be vital um it is and uh, the what the thing that will be a massive shame will be if they if they miss hit with this because marvel is a goliath like you know disney is massive and to kind of to, to miss with something that should be as much of an open goal as this as a reskin of overwatch I, I think could be. I, I was going to say nail in the coffin for their gaming, like their um, their designs on gaming, but I don't. I don't think it will be a nail in the coffin. But I think it would be a real um, uh, like eye opener for them about how why they just keep getting stuff wrong when it comes to games. Um, 
so I so I hope I, I do you know what I'm hoping this is going to be really good and I'm I am looking forward to um uh, hearing more about it seeing more about it like that uh, if there is an alpha or whatever that would be great to see some gameplay and to hear some you know how it actually feels and functions um absolutely yeah 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 no it's nice um it's nice to have something uh, I, I gather that some people had knew that this was coming but for me who wasn't in the know it was nice to have this kind of dropped on you and immediately be kind of like you know a month or two away from being able to depending on what the kind of the the you know the releases you have to sign to enter that closed alpha hopefully have some people talking about it or we get to see a little bit more about it before long um but that is marvel rivals um which as we mentioned you know some of you might be playing it in a month's time but even if you are playing it in the month of may you are still going to need some other things to tide you over for the next handful of weeks which is where our our, our segment that the world adores <laughs> steps in that's right it's that one podcast of every four or five where we remind you which games are coming out this month um a segment that was almost at one point twice twice as frequent as it even is now <laughs> um yeah, shout out to anyone who remembers that uh, interesting little moment that Jonesy and I shared live on a podcast. <laughs> um, I'll be honest with you, Jonesy. A lot of people are still going to be playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Dragon's Dogma 2, you know, things like that. Uh, they're still going to be playing some extremely long games. And I'm going to say up front, that's probably for the best. Because while there are some big heavy hitters still to come out in April and even beyond... Um, we're entering into what I think is going to be a a disappointingly quiet summer. I was looking at the Wikipedia article earlier, 2024 in video games, and I wasn't sure there was a single video game scheduled for release in June or July that I wanted to purchase. Wow. Um, yes. Fortunately, though, we're not in June or July. We're in April, and April is slightly chirpier. Um, although... Again, the first couple of weeks of April, I had a look at what there was. Nothing stood out to me, Jonesy. Even some of the games I have pulled to mention are kind of notable for different reasons. Um, for, foremost amongst them, Harold Halibut, a game that many people might not register from name alone, but it was the game that has that really cool stop-motion uh, art style. I recommend anyone go and look up a trailer, because if you can get kind of hooked on games by look and aesthetic alone, that's up there. Grounded. Obviously, um, the Obsidian game that has been a smash hit for Microsoft and Xbox for a while now is finally making its way to Switch and PS5. Those games both coming out on the 16th of April. And then, just two days after that, Jonesy, we get one of Chris's most anticipated games yes. for the entire year as No Rest for the Wicked enters early access. And I haven't replied to him yet, but Chris texted me earlier asking if I was going to play. And I don't know if I'm going to go right in at early access or if I'm going to wait until wait until it's kind of not all the way there yet but at least most of the way there content wise polish wise and then jump in i i still don't know how i feel about those kind of situations where do you stand on on not on early access in general but on when the right time for you is to jump in as the kind of player you are it's for me it's massively game by game um if it's a game i just cannot live without that i'll go i'll go super early access um, if it's something like this, like No Rest for the Wicked, looks a lot, looks very good, looks like something I would like to have a go at. I'm not getting in there early access. Uh, I'll, I'll wait. Okay. I'll wait. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I don't know how long you're going to have to be waiting, um, but luckily there are still other things not far behind it, including Tales of Kinsera Zao, which is um, I don't know if you remember this, Jonesy. This was the kind of the roguelike the, on the Metroidvania rather that was announced, I believe, at the Game Awards. That a, it was a young English guy who uh, had made this game. I think he was an actor who was making this game as kind of oh, like a tribute to right. his dad. Yes, um, yeah, I do remember. Yeah, yeah, and I think this has been picked up by EA as part of their originals label. It's out on the twenty third of April on all platforms. But the good news for PlayStation players is it is going to be a PlayStation Plus title, so you'll be able to pick that one up for free. One game that PlayStation fans will not be able to pick up for free is Stellar Blade. That releases a handful of days later on the 26th of April at full price. More on that later. Um, 26th of April, a pretty busy time. Sandland, also on the way across every major platform. I guess Sandland, uh, at this point, um, sadly, probably notable, notable for being one of the last things that uh, Akira Toriyama would have worked on prior to his passing at the start of March. Um, 
obviously his extremely iconic and noticeable art style all over that. Um, and then Top Spin, one of the um, the more beloved tennis franchises out there, makes a grand return also on the 26th of April. Top Spin, Top Spin at 2K25 on every major platform. And then finally, also on the 26th of April, one thing I saw that I was picking up a fair bit of heat on the PC market, a game called Manor Lords, which looks to be a medieval era tactics game i think it i think at the start going into the start of the year it already had i think two million wish lists on steam um wow, so okay. a pretty big deal that yeah. um that seems like the kind of game that steph would have on his radar for example and then we round out the month on the 30th of april with braid anniversary edition coming to all major platforms including netflix great opportunity to go back and play braid if you haven't which was a, a classic indie game of the uh, xbox arcade era and then um, another port, Jonesy, um, and something else we're going to kind of weirdly touch on later. Sea of Thieves makes it to PlayStation 5 on April 30th. Um, so PlayStation fans can look forward to swallowing a bunch of salty liquids that's not just come... I don't know what... Then. Ignore, don't ignore <laughs> it. I'm not, fin not finishing the thought. Um, anything there that you're going to get the checkbook out for because you pay for video games with checks for some reason? That's just the kind of guy you are? Uh, no. <laughs> You're honest. I, I, feel, so, I feel like we've jumped the shaft on the Silver Blade discussion a little bit there, but yeah, honest. <laughs> But like, uh, so Braid Anniversary Edition coming to Netflix. I might, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed Braid. I finished Braid years ago, but I'm I, a great game. Might go back and have a little blast if that's coming to Netflix. Why not? Um, yeah, Stella Blade probably not. Um, Grounded. I mean, G I, can't, I played Grounded for the first time like with you guys like so long ago now. I think I'm. Yeah. I had my Grounded, uh, my Grounded days, and I, I enjoyed it. Not looking to pick that up anytime soon, though. Um, so no, uh, pr probably. That was probably not. Zero on PlayStation Plus. Probably not. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, we'll is the best policy. It's we'll all see. good. It's all good. I think the message that is coming across loud and clear right now is that Jonesy wants to play all of these games. He just can't afford to, which is why you need to head over to patreon.com forward slash super show and just start pledging a little bit more money because Lord knows if Jonesy can't buy Mana Lords and get involved with all the Steam heads out there on day of release, <laughs> then he's not going to be living his best life. Um, but all joking aside, this podcast is entirely made possible by your generosity and the generosity of our wonderful patrons who have gone over to patreon.com forward slash super show and seen fit to pledge anything from $2 a month to help keep this podcast going. Um, and you will be rewarded for your efforts. There are various goodies available at various tiers, everything from access to our Discord server to patron-exclusive podcasts, patron-exclusive videos. All the details are over there on Patreon dot com forward slash super show a huge thank you to anyone who is um, supporting us or considering supporting us um and i think it's important that we give some shout outs to first of all some people some fine folks whose names are on screen right now huge thank you to all of them but i also want to give a personal shout out to aaron cameron athletic gravy brimstone ice not rock salt jesper camdahl nielsen pastors guild and then, of course, we have the big dogs, the real, what am I going to say? The real manor lords. Get it? It's it's, it's a call it's a cool to call back. It's fucking, it's comedy. Okay, it's comedy. Brett Z, a.k.a. Shellshock, Geometric Potter, Hacksaw Bookread, Manuel Guerrero, and Peaswad. Once again, a huge thank you to each and every one of you and every single uh, patron we've had, past, present, and indeed future, um, for helping keep this podcast going. Genuinely, um, for as much as we joke about uh, it being the thing that allows us to buy. We, don't worry, we have jobs. We we, we are safe Just about. and secure. Our families are being fed. Um, um, so you just help us keep talking about video games into mics, which at this point is is all is all we need, right, Gen Z? It is. Yeah. Thank you so much to everybody. Um, I would also give, like to give a quick shout out to some people uh, joining us in the chat as we go out live on the YouTubes. Uh, we've got Joel, uh, Bubba Killer, Rodrigo, Magni, 69DJ, um, who are all hanging out, Classy Cat as well uh, in the chat. So thank you guys for joining us and for chatting um, along as we... Uh, as we crack on i will actually just say joel says he can't play grounded um, or it's hard to play because he has arachnophobia interesting tidbit in case you didn't know grounded actually has an arachnophobia slider which lets you reduce uh how much a spider looks like a spider and you can end up with it effectively just being a blob 
so yeah. it doesn't have any legs it's not hairy it doesn't have weird eyes and fangs um yeah to, to uh, so that you can play it genius feature but one i'm glad that we didn't mess with because we did end up getting a a a great clip somewhere on someone's twitch of steph legitimately getting jump scared by a giant tarantula <laughs> coming around a corner at night um one of these I, I know chris always bugs me to do it but one of these days we really do need to go back and just find and save for posterity all the clips from all the streams that we were doing sort of circa 2020 because there was a time where between you know me and yourself but then also chris and and steph and and a bunch of people like we were streaming out there, there was hours and hours of content hitting the net at any given time and there were some absolute nuggets of gold in there i hope we don't lose them um to the inevitable decay of the internet um over time but we'll see um jonesy how about we do um a little bit of catch-up uh talk about what we've been playing what we've been watching what we've been doing for this past week uh, I would, if I think maybe the best way to go about this is if I start with you and you talk about one of the uh, the thing that you you have been playing recently that I haven't been playing, and then we can segue into a more open ended discussion about the things we've both played. Uh, decent, yeah. Um, Assassin's Creed Mirage. I finally yeah. had uh, the opportunity and the inclination to hop in um, and play a bit of that. Uh, and it, you know, it scratched an itch that I have had for a long time, which is to get back to um, Assassin's Creed proper, where you are pushing people out of the way in sort of slightly <laughs> built up, pretty historical environments, um, and then stabbing sandy. sandy environments and stabbing other people um, through the collarbone and, and ending lives. Um, it's yeah, I, it's was funny because it's one of those games that I it feels like home in some respects like i've played assassin's creed games since the very first one you know for over the, over yeah. the years and i was one of those people that when it kind of died went away a bit and ended up being a bit more rpg they're fantastic games but it kind of just felt like it was getting away from what it used to be so i was one of those people that's quite happy that they they did mirage um they allowed some of us to go back to to the roots and to experience that that it does remind you that some of that game is frustrating as all hell like in order to have climbing mechanics as good as they have, you do sometimes end up with some weirdness, like your character will oh. randomly leap uh, sideways for no apparent reason, or um, Basim will just seemingly do his own thing, and you're like, no, that's not what I wanted, but, you know, um, or you'll, and you'll jump down, like I've, a couple of times I've just jumped right into the path of someone who I was trying to hide from, and I was like, yeah, li not what I was trying to get you to do at all. Um, kind of the opposite. Exactly, uh, but no, it, it, it's, yeah, um, very very enjoyable um really been having a good time with it uh, baghdad is a beautiful sort of city to to be um to be wandering around in and one of the things i must admit i really enjoy about assassin's creed games is I, it's probably not like historically historically accurate to like any degree and i'm sure if you sat down with an actual historian they would say well this is not right that's not right etc etc um but I just I love how much they make it feel like that's what the cities would have looked like, and it and it, not many games right. give you a chance to actually just experience, you know, history firsthand, and in a way, in a free running, uh, open world kind of way that makes you think like, oh yeah, this literally could have been could have been what it was like to be there, and they will still give you the idea of like you can check out places and look at historical places, and it will, and some of them are like based on historic real real historical places, or you know this market would have looked like this, or this place would have looked like this. They must use some license somewhere, some you know to uh, make a, a, a level that's playable. Yeah. But but I I know I, I've always been a fan of that aspect of Assassin's Creed games. So yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a, there was always a bit of that in. Um, did you ever play Watch Dogs Legion? Yes. Yeah, there was I, there, there was some of that in kinds of in that game where like you could tell that you were playing an approximation of London, but it it yeah. it's almost like I think I remember saying at the time it was almost like they had a rule where every fifty feet there has to be something that makes it feel like London, and if you do that often enough, then <laughs> right. you will still like you even if you like you go like okay i'm in a place that doesn't really exist because it's actually a mixture of that from this place and this road from that place and this from that place because they had to condense it down a thousand of times of course whatever. yeah yeah but it still feels like london because of x y or z definitely that, that's a great that is a great example like you yeah because that game is not london you couldn't go in it and go street for street but if you play that I want I and I spend a lot of time in london you will definitely get the feel for what london feels like to be in and that is what yeah. i think they have done 
with the with uh, I think and I think they always do it with the Assassin's Creed mm. games is they let you feel what it would have felt like to be there. Um and and I love that. I think that's that's um yeah, that is something that Ubisoft does better than anyone else. Um, that I think one thing they nail for me is uh, those cities and those environments and all of that. I mean, you know, take what you, the rest of it you can take with a bit of a pinch of salt if you want, like the actual stories and stuff. But yeah, I'm enjoying. Well, it. safe to th- say that was kind of what I was going to ask though. Is that I guess there's one thing about the Assassin's Creed series that's still true to this day is that it rarely sits still for long. And whilst Mirage was kind of a bit of a throwback Assassin's Creed game that stripped back some of the kind of sprawling RPG level gated um, elements of previous games and grounded some of the more mystical elements in things like gadgets rather than, hey, like you've got God powers now. Um, From what we know, the future of Assassin's Creed is still going to be this sort of very broad thing where they've got, you know, they're, they're working on Infinity, the kind of the launcher. And I think the next mainline Assassin's Creed game, codenamed Red, the one in Japan, is going to be another big Odyssey style sprawling RPG that will probably take 100 hours to complete. Is there any part of you that sat there going, damn, they made an Assassin's Creed I liked and they're now going to immediately make one I'm not going to like? Or do you feel like you're more back? Or do you feel like Mirage has helped you get back on board? That has made you more open-minded as to where the future might go. I, so I, it's not for me that I don't want to play them. Like I, for me, like uh, Valhalla, I love Valhalla. I played a lot of it, but I just, I couldn't, just couldn't finish that game. It was just too big, and I ended up moving on to something else. Whereas like something like Mirage, just the sure the sheer scale of the game because it's so much smaller. Um, it's just much more uh, finishable in that sense mm. so whatever they put out like i i will still be up for whatever they release i just know that the reality is i probably won't i'll probably end up moving on before i get to the before i roll credits on it which um is a real shame uh in that sense but hey i'm a guy with limited time in um this these days so unfortunately i won't be able to roll credits on everything i play but i've kind of gotten used to that um maybe i shouldn't play so much hell divers too and then i have a bit more um a bit more time um yeah. before we move on before you tell me what something you've been playing or we talk about something else i just want to give a quick shout out because uh magni has uh has said that it was super chatted as well he's he's given us 20 knock i don't even know what that is but i don't care because i'm I gonna give norwegian krona oh okay but um, it wouldn't matter if it was one british penny because it is magni's birthday so i would just like to give magni oh, wow. a shout out and say happy birthday um, and I'm sure Jamie would like to as well. Yeah, a massive, massive happy birthday, and thank you very much for the super. Usually, it's other the other way around. Usually, we would be giving you a present on your birthday, but that's for, that's um, very kind of you. And ha- have, I hope you have an amazing day. Well, you have, uh, well, actually, Norway are an hour and a head, so I hope you have had an amazing day. Um, yeah. Um. All right. Was it, so? Was there any other closing thoughts on Mirage, Jonesy? Or no, that, that... I, I, I'm probably. I, I guess I'm a third of the way through. I uh, hope to finish it up. Let's. I hope to finish it up in the next week or so. I don't know if that'll happen, but we'll, we'll see. See, it's it, like you said. It's doable. You know, it's it, it's not bite size. I think it was one of those things where everyone had described it as the small and you know manageable Assassin's Creed game, and I think I kind of. Um, uh, you know, um, I think I kind of took that information around with it a little bit when I played it. And I was like, oh, this did actually end up being slightly longer than I thought it was going to be, but still nothing compared to Odyssey. I, I had that. I had exactly the same thing. Like I'd, I'd put about four hours into it. And from what I'd heard, I was like people telling me that I was probably halfway through. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I am at like four hours. I think I've still got a decent chunk still to go. Yeah, I mean, you'll you'll know having played enough of it already to to see kind of the way it's structured. You'll be you'll be beginning to see like how it yeah how, how progression works in that game yeah. and how many more things you need to do before you get to this thing. And it's like okay, I'm beginning to see how this works and what I'm doing in each of these different regions of the map. And yeah, exactly, and once you yeah. kind of wrap your head around that, you can get a pretty good idea of how much longer you're going to be playing it. I will say, if anyone needs a palate cleanser. Um, so they could completed uh, be completed comfortably in um, a sitting or two. I want to give a quick shout out to Open Roads. Um, I, 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 not necessarily a shout out because I think it's an amazing game. I think in some respects it's a, it's a very middling game, but I, I feel like I I think I I think I made a note of it when we were doing our kind of uh, when we did our last sort of look ahead to the upcoming schedule. I think I gave it a bit of a shout out because on paper I was quite excited for it. It's the 
Annapurna Interactive published um, game from the studio that was formerly known as Fulbright um, of Gone Home and Tacoma fame before Steve Gaynor um, was, I guess, ousted from the company. Um, fortunately, it seems like the remainder of that team kind of stayed together and their hard work wasn't lost and Open Roads has made it out and it's on Game Pass. So um, anyone who's interested can go and, and have a look. And it is very much like the work that they've done before on games like Gone Home and Tacoma in that this is a narrative-driven first-person adventure game where um, you play as a 16-year-old girl uh, called uh, Tess who uh, you're going through your grandmother's possessions. You and your mother, your mother's called Opal, um, are going through your grandmother's possessions after she has uh, passed away and like the house is up for foreclosure and all this kind of stuff is going on. And without saying too much, although this is kind of the premise of the game and it happens quite early on, you stumble upon some mysterious belongings like a, a diary that you didn't know existed and some letters from someone who appears to be a mysterious lover who your mother wasn't aware about and a key that you're not sure what it unlocks. And basically Tess, the 16 year old, manages to convince her mother that the two should go on a road trip, hence open roads. And so the game is kind of structured around exploring these environments, interacting with objects and kind of keepsakes that inspire conversations between the two. Um, and then these uh, interstitial um, scenes where you're traveling on the, on the road and having conversations. And like, there's some light LA noir style rotating an object around and commenting on it there's some occasional dialogue choices um it's just a shame that those dialogue choices like much of the game story threads seem broadly quite inconsequential um if you're listening to everything i've said so far and wondering kind of like what the hook is you're right <laughs> open roads is a game that like is is nice and has a lot of charm and humor and like some of the moments of moment writing is 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 good and the performances are quite strong. Interestingly enough, um Tess, the protagonist, is played by Caitlin Diva, who will of course be playing Abby in season two of The Last of Us. So if anyone wants to get a head start on what she would sounds like when she's playing the most different character to Abby imaginable, then then you can try this, I guess. But yeah, there's no real it's not like, you know, um, games like this need a sense of, like, threat or peril. But, like, even even if you're going to, like, even if you look at something like, we both play Firewatch, right? Even if you look at something like that, which had, like, there was the the emotional sort of, like, core to Firewatch. Yeah. But, like, the, the mystery and the uncertainty around Firewatch that lasted for two-thirds of that game before it started to unravel it was extremely engaging. And it felt like it could have gone anywhere. And Open Roads is never a game that feels like it's going to go anywhere. It picks up and uh, drops some story threads a little bit too readily. And when it is time to wrap up, you're like, oh, like, that was disappointingly inconsequential. Nice, right. but not much more than that. Um, and I think that made it a little bit disappointing for me, uh, given, you know, some of the, you know, the, the pedigree of the team involved and the fact that I felt like, I actually had a good window for this kind of um, this kind of palate cleanser in my gaming life right now, um, and it didn't tick every box. But it is on Game Pass, so if you want to try it as a part of that subscription, I'm trying to get out of the habit of calling them free. Um, <laughs> then, then you can do so. Yeah, they are not. They are not actually free. Um, something else is, which isn't free: super chats. But we've had another one come in from Bobby Killer, hey. uh, dropping the uh, twenty DKKs. Don't know what they are either, but thank you very much. Uh, your, it just says DKKs. games exclamation I'm, point. I'm I'm gonna guess Dutch. Like, is that Dutch Corona maybe or something like that? Uh, do they have a Corona? Danish Corona. Danish. That's what I was thinking. No, that, that's Euro. They use the euros, and oh, I don't get uh, out <laughs> in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, it's all, it's just those weird um, those those bloody Scandinavian countries that just that try and be different. Um, I was in Switzerland yeah, recently. Indeed. I was in Switzerland recently, and they use chuffs, and I was just like, I don't know what a chuff is. What? It's, it's no, it's not. It's, it's uh, they they abbreviate to CHFs, which is uh, Swiss. Swiss francs, Franks, Swiss francs, but it just says CHF and everyone calls them chuffs. So I was just like, I don't know much of chuff. Do, do but no, Bobby Killer, thank, thank you very much for the uh, for the super chat. Uh, not, from what I, uh, I don't know. From what I understand, they so don't. Hang on, this is a homework session that absolutely no one asked for. But if I don't do it now, I'll do it. I'll never do it. Which countries use euros? 
I don't know, European ones, some some European ones. But we, we've just named three European countries that in a row that France, don't. Germany, Spain, Portugal, Italy, values. Portugal, Greece, Ireland, and oh, Netherlands is there, so I wasn't right. wrong. Belgium, Austria, Finland, Slovakia, Montenegro, Cyprus, Slovenia, Lithuania. So basically, <laughs> Loads. all we all we did in going from Norway to Denmark, to Switzerland, back to back, we just named the three, probably the three of the biggest like rogue countries, other than obviously us, um, who are like. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're good. <laughs> we are good. Uh, but all the country, all the countries where people are paid a lot of money and have high qualities of life, um, and it, but also things are very expensive. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, as they'll often remind you. Uh, do you know what's not expensive, Jonesy? What's that? It's the demo of Stellar Blade <laughs> because it's a demo, and it is now um, as of uh, well, a co- the 29th of March. So less than a week ago, uh, released worldwide. You may have been forgiven for thinking the demo was already out, but that was a mistake. It was, of course, accidentally published early a whole month ago, basically on the 8th of March um, and taken down within 25 minutes. Although some people did get to play it. Now the world can play it. And fortunately for you listeners, the world includes Jonesy and I. Um, Your thoughts, good sir, if I may, on um, one of Sony's biggest remaining exclusive technically first party titles of the year Stellar Blade um okay I'm I really want to hear what you thought because you said that you got some interesting takes but I'll give you I'll give you my rough outline and then we can see where we agree and where we disagree um okay I thought it was a uh a reasonably pretty game I thought it was um a bit of a interesting kind of mashup of a few different concepts like the uh the character designs for the um uh for eve and a couple of her cohorts the very skimpy outfits that i'm sure a lot of people have seen the jiggle physics you know all of that was absolutely fine fantastic great a little weird like and a little over the top in places like um you yes. know i've 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 in my time played a couple of those games that are um, less about being gamer games and more about being, uh, you know, showing you some jiggle physics. And it was kind of more of one of those games in, in some respects, some of the designs, some of the design choices. But when you get to like the enemy types and how what they look like and how they interact with you, I wasn't as uh, excited about what they went for with this. It just seemed like they kind of went, oh, generic enemy, generic enemy. And they some some stuff seemed to be a bit, bit of a mess i didn't play like the entire demo i think i played maybe like an hour um oh, i some... completed it about an hour oh okay. i i i, I did might have been close to the end oh may, maybe i was and then i, I was like do you know what i think I, I was having a really bad day gaming and i'd <laughs> i just played hell divers and i'd been terrible and then i i was gonna play with martin ruffle i was gonna play some hell divers and then he couldn't make it on and then i was like oh, let me play some stellar blade I, and then yeah, didn't have a, an amazing time with it. But I was like, this is me. I've got, I just wasn't feeling gaming that day. So then I just qu- I just quit and went to bed. <laughs> it's one of those. Um, so it was yeah, like uh, there's there's some strangeness with regards. I don't know if it's it, just the demo or the actual game is like this, but way that it cuts to a section where you start out and then a section that seemed to be a lot later on. But then afterwards, I thought, oh, it wasn't. They just they just yeah. move you along in a weird way. I was way. confused about that as well. Because the demo also seems to apply that your save data carries over to the main game, yes. which suggests that that what we played in the demo is kind of the opening of the game presented as intended. But you're right. There is a weird jump wherein the protagonist situation has changed. And so did... Okay, let me just ask this. Did you play long enough to get a, a flashback cutscene where you saw how Eve and the Adam met? Yes, yeah, I did, I did. Um, so I played, okay. I played through that, and it does I start to backfill boss. some of that stuff, right? Yeah, so I played that, and yeah. that, which is that's what how it made me think like, oh no, this is continuous, continuous. This is how this is how this game is, and I was like, wow, that's a little bit yeah. of a weird choice about for the narrative because it felt quite disjointed and not in like a purposeful way. Um, the combat was easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, it, it wasn't from soft level of hard uh which yeah. was good which was i appreciated i didn't i didn't mess with the difficulty i played it on standard difficulty um it's a bit more hack and slash than i thought it was going to be and like i said um blocking is a lot more forgiving than i thought it was going to be um i thought this was going to be a much rougher when it came to like boss fights and stuff uh it kind of has some elements of final fantasy and uh look more modern final fantasy games 
that I was not expecting, but I was was yeah was was good. I thought was the combat was fun in that capacity. Um, when I say that, I'm talking about like the um the way you can like hold L one and do the specials, which feels a little bit like the Final Fantasy seven like remake and stuff, where you've got some of those because uh, it's not time based like they used to be, are they? It's, it's real time. Um, I don't know. It was, wasn't quite what I was expecting. It was a bit easier. It was a little bit more uh, Bayonetta and less FromSoft. It seemed. Uh but See, I, 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 it's interesting. I think that I, I agree that it exists on that spectrum, but I thought it was like a little bit more from software than platinum. Okay. Um, well, I see. I was, I was kind of because a lot of people talk about games like Bloodborne and that, and say oh, my favorite game of all time. Love Bloodborne. I couldn't stand Bloodborne because I was so bad at it, <laughs> and I just get, get kept getting killed, and I never pl- and I just I rage quit and was like, I'm never touching this game ever again. And so this was a lot more forgiving than that, um, which I appreciated. Yeah. Um, but then some of it, like I just can't. I just can't. Like wh- the way that you collect stuff, the way that the the your little friend talk, Adam talks to you, little boxes you open, where you upgrade stuff. I'm just. It's not my cup of tea. It's from a different type of game that I don't really play. And I, I'm. There was enough of that to put me off. I'd. I suppose I'd say there's enough like Eastern influence in this, which is not what I normally play, which has put me made me think that I'm not kind of there for it. Interesting. I mean, you've highlighted some of the things that I was going to highlight, but you've come away from them with a, com- a completely different conclusion hit me, hit me. to the conclusions that I Go drew. for it. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I, I share a lot of your sentiments, and I think there are positives here. Like, I think that for a, a, a like, a, a let's call them a first-time developer. I think they've made some mobile stuff before, before but for a first-time developer coming out of uh, Korea, which, you know, we don't get a lot of console games released in the world, best from korean developers like i think it's a, a pretty strong like polished kind of opening like salvo like the vi- the visuals in terms of their actual like fidelity and the quality of the visuals are quite strong like the mechanics it like it felt sound um uh like uh so i guess some credit uh has to um be given to them for that and I, I thought the combat was also was pretty good I, I i think i liked it about as much as i thought i would um i agree with you that it's sort of it's slightly more flashy and as you you said rightly so forgiving than than something um from soft from from from, from so- software for example that's hard to say like but then a from software title for example but at the same time i think it had enough of those fundamentals of Certainly, when you're not dealing with like the smaller mobs, when you're dealing with enemies that have a little bit more of an oomph to them, you're still locking on and you're still paying, very much paying attention to what they do. And you might, yeah, you've got a much bigger parry window than you're probably used to from from. I've done it again. But from <laughs> software might have given you. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I was still locking on and I was still being careful and I was still dodging and I was still parrying and I was still being considerate about the amount of attacks I would get in certain windows and that. And 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 I was still resting at not not quite bonfires, the vending machine equivalent of bonfires <laughs> yeah. to let you know with enemies respawn. And I know you know by the time we get to the point in you know in video games where you that describes a Star Wars game as much as it describes a, a from software game, you know it's not really aping or mimicking anything in particular anymore. It's just a trope of what has now become a genre, and that's fine. Um, but it you know it re- immediately tells you. Or communicates with you a certain degree of like the kind of game you're playing, and and, and I was up for that. I think the problem is I I have the, I have kind of the same thing as I think you, you do with a lot of this stuff, which is that I remember reading when I, once I finished the demo a lot of really positive responses to it, uh, both on social media and in some cases even on our Discord, for example. And I was reading um, people describe finishing the demo and then getting into this sort of boss rush mode or that you unlock when you finish the demo. Right. And I was sat there going, oh, I finished the demo, beat the boss at the end of the demo, saw I unlocked this boss mode and was like, that's the last thing I want to do right now. I, I don't know why. That's just not the way my brain yeah. functions. Because like for me, when I'm playing Still a Blade, I'm not playing it to see, you know, how much of an analog its combat is to to combat in other games and how I'm going to get like really absorbed into these systems and start playing it like and you because you know what it's like when you watch someone who's got a thousand hours in Elden Ring play Elden Ring and you look at them and you're like that looks like they're playing this game in a completely different way to how I would play it I'm never going to become one of those players and for me it was therefore the stuff around the the fringes of Stellar Blade's combat and its primary systems 
that were going to sell the game for me, and they didn't. And I've been a little bit taken aback by how little conversation there has been about just how rote or boring or mundane or like like ordinary the tr- like Stellar Blades trimming is. Right. Um, like, and and don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not even going to go down the whole road of like the the stuff about like you know how many of the the not not just the protagonists, but how many of the the primary characters are these. Uh, very attractive women, women wearing very tight, very very wearing very tight outfits that have high heels worked into them, and some very interesting, albeit very enjoyable, uh, body proportions with physics um, that um, don't correspond with much of the physics we are familiar with on here on planet Earth, in spite of the game ostensibly being set there, from what I can understand, and that kind of gets at like some of the overarching things that I, I feel about the game, like. Um, the story premise, like, like it, it, it was hinting at, and even the music. Anyone who listens to the score, like, there was a lot of near automata going on here. Near automata, was, like, immediately presents a far more interesting um, take on so many of the themes that Stella Blade is kind of like getting at or hinting at. Um, that I was like, a lot of this feels redundant, and it feels. Look, put it this way: the second a protagonist called Eve interact with a with a secondary character called adam my eyes are doing one thing and that's rolling um <laughs> like the 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 prem, the the, prem, the premise felt wrote the moment to moment writing felt like really really rather flat the the vote the, vo- the, vo- the vocal performances were largely just fine like the 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 kind of the chemistry and the banter between um between Eve and Adam was almost non-existent in spite of the fact that Adam, as you mentioned, is kind of with you all the time through a drone. You think back to, again, it wasn't perfect, but the way uh, Platinum um, characterized two, uh, 9A, um, I'm going to get them the wrong way, wrong way around, 9A and 2B, or the the, 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 the characters in, in Near Automata and their interactions and how they developed over um, a lot of playtime and a lot of endings, admittedly, yes, but they got there um, well and truly in a way that Silla Blade didn't even hint at inside its opening hour. Um, then you have, like, from a design perspective, and I don't mean, like, gameplay design, but almost, like, world design perspective, so many of the elements felt like they were signed off or greenlit because they were cool, but, like, no one stopped to think, hang on a second, all these things are going to be a part of the same game. Yes, like, that ship looks cool. Yes, that outfit looks cool. Yes, that weapon or that vehicle or that that monster design or that you know that environment and that landmark all of these things look cool and the art is genuinely quite is really well done but then they all got put in the same game yes and I'm like like that it just felt like a lot of disparate elements that didn't come together like you think about um from software titles that is cohesion up the fucking ass like and I go on YouTube and I'll get recommended a video and it makes where sense. someone is yeah and and it makes it such to such a degree that people go out onto YouTube and they make 5 hour long videos about like the walls in Bloodborne, and it's like there's none of that in Stellar Blade. Like that, that it felt like that, that that idea of creating like a cohesive world where everything from the environments to the characters that inhabit it to like any hints at potential law, you know, the, the, going back through you know this invasion and the origins of the Natiba, which is the name of the alien species that is sort of taken over Earth. I have no interest in any of that whatsoever, and it didn't try to get me interested in any of that whatsoever. Even the idea of exploring the ruins of Earth, like somehow, felt like drab in in Stellar Blade to me. And well, the way they introduced it was odd. Was like saying there, there was no introduction. It was almost like here you are, uh, out you get Eve, go and have a look around, and then you're looking around, and they're like, oh, this is Earth, is it? And you're like, oh yeah, look, it's all crumbly. And you kind of yeah. go, oh, and they're like, oh, look, here's these generic spider monsters that are going, oh, the spider monsters are going to get you. They're going to get you. And, that, and it was, for me, like, I I really didn't like, and maybe maybe the law solves this and maybe it makes sense. I didn't like the, the enemy types that looked like they were just pulled out of um, any old... Um, uh, Don't say uh, asset stores. No, no, no. I was going to say, what's the, guy, the guy's name? The, the author, you know, the, the horror... Uh, oh, author or artist? Uh, no author, but his uh, uh, the, the old English guy does all the horror stuff that people like. Was oh um, yeah, uh, I know who you're talking about. Oh you're my goodness, about, um, I've got one of his uh, books and I can't even think what his what he's called. Um, anyway, 
that Lovecraft. Lovecraft. It's just they're just Lovecraftian. <laughs> sorry, they're just Lovecraftian horrors. But Lovecraft's thing was like the the, the horrors kind of fit in the environments that they were put in. For me, these were like the weird Lovecraftian things that just popped up for no apparent reason. It was like body horror Lovecraftian enemies that. I mean, maybe maybe the game gets into it, but then you start. I like I said, I literally just played Hell Divers two, and then I went to this, and you get. And I'm also reading Starship Troopers, the novel at the moment, and you're dropped into an environment at the beginning of this game in a Helldiver pod, uh, which is exactly the same as Starship Troopers in the book have it, that you drop in in these pods, but then it just felt weird because then you get out and you're in this sexy outfit with a sword and you're like, but hold on, I've just dropped in from this insanely high-tech spaceship with these pods so they could just blast these little ugly monsters that just have clubs from the from space but instead we're dropping in and attacking them with sword it was just like a ver- it was like you said it was a disjointed game that f- a demo sorry it was a just dis- disjointed no, demo I, I think I, it was a just j- disjointed demo of a disjointed game but like, i, I, I want to like i don't want to i don't want to take away that the game might f- cover a lot of this and fill a lot of the holes i'm maybe it won't at all maybe i mean then, I, I, I don't see how it could to be fair because they just seem quite gaping yeah, and I, there's honest, also there's a trailer that plays right at the end of the demo, and it looked like it just gets even zanier. And there's a part of me that respects that. There's a part of me that l- watched that trailer at the, that plays at the end of the demo and thought, some of that shit looked way cooler than the shit that I just did. <laughs> right. Some of those environments look way more interesting to explore, and I'm sure the combat will get more interesting. Um, which is why I, 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 Stellar Blade is a, is a good game that I have a lot of bad things to say about. If that makes sense, yeah, um, I, I could easily imagine that that it's a game that if you spent a lot of time with, you could end like, and you could go out and someone could say, "Oh yeah, that game with the jiggle physics," and you could be like, "You shut up! You don't know what you're talking about." Because like, you might have fallen in love with the this game and this characters and this yeah. world and had a phenomenal time with it, and as you said, become a phenomenal player. But I, there's just so much that seems messy um, from the outset yeah. that is just does not, and, and yeah. And not even messy from a technical sense. That's what's so no, 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 not from a technical it. sense. Technically, I yeah. it was one of the. It was, I you know, I enjoyed what a lot of what it was laying down. Like I said, some of the some of the systems and some of the way they chose to implement them, I'm not a fan of. But then yeah. that's just personal taste. So. And like there was also like a, a certain degree of like linearity to it that I, I don't think is problematic. But I think it is interesting that's coming out at a time where you know the kind of the originators of so many of the ideas that Celebrate borrows from have moved on. And that's not my roundabout way of saying that post Elden Ring, every game like this needs to be open world. I don't think that at no, all. No, God no, not at but all. But I just think that like, like Stellar Blade's attempt at um, like circumventing a feat, the feeling of linearity are, oh, if you take this path slightly early, you can like, w- like go down an alleyway for ten seconds, and there'll be a crate at the end of it, and you open up the crate, this crate, and these glowing dots will come out. And these glowing dots, you'll pick them up and you won't really know what they're for or how meaningful they are or what they're contributing to. But at the end of the day, you're like, you'll be able to click one button on a menu and be told your sword got plus one stronger. Or you'll you know, you'll be yes. able to put a point into a skill tree that itself... I mean, it's always a bad sign when you're playing a demo, you go through every pip on a skill tree and go, I don't care what I get next. Um, as, and, 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 and that was, and again, like... That was what a lot of the exploration felt like as I was moving through that environment, and I I, I enjoyed the, the combat encounters when they sparked up, and I enjoyed you know the, the the big boss fight at the end of the um of the demo that was appropriately tense and and was was challenging, but uh, in a way that like I almost liked the fact that there was uh, a little bit more forgiving than some of the games we're used to, but overall it was it was just a weird hodgepodge of ideas and designs and like new school game design and very old school game design and some parts of it that feel cutting edge and other parts of it that feel like a 360 PS3 game. And like you said, uh, some people are going to have a wicked time with Silla Blade. I saw a tweet of someone who had cancelled their pre-order because, Jonesy, plot twist, they wanted to pre-order the Deluxe Edition instead (laughs) and called it their Game of the Year contender for them. And I read that and thought, wow, isn't it interesting how how different... (laughs) How different you know opinions can be formed on on one thing, but for me, I think I, I go back to that thing I said earlier that Stellar Blade is a fundamentally good game that I dislike a lot of things about. I, um, I did, I did and I, see. And I don't know where that leaves me. I did see a tweet that someone said which I thought was quite a fun idea, um, which was that you can choose to play naked, 
which is yeah, not... there's, a, there's a skin suit, isn't there? Yeah, you see, you're not naked, naked, but it's, it's like as as skimpy as they as probably Sony allowed them to go. Um, but if you choose to do that, you actually lose some of your damage resistance because even though even that your suit is very skimpy that she wears anyway, it does actually give you some damage resistance. Uh, so you do you lose that, which I thought was the hell. I that's cool. That's, that's like a fun thing to say, hey, you, you want to have a little more of a look? You can have more of a look, but it's going to uh, make the game more challenging. Like, I thought that was fun, but um, yeah, no, it, it's, it's, hey, there we go. And then apart from that, all I kept seeing was tweets about Stellar Blade was that the main character is actually real because it's based on this real woman, apparently. Um, uh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so con- congratulations to her. Where someone was like, uh, this is dumb because it's unrealistic. And then someone responded like it was based on a real mo- mo- model, and then there's a picture of that model, and arguments about whether that model's proportions or measurements in certain departments were adjusted for the sake of the video game. Which I don't oh, know right. if there was a conclusion on that. I then saw another argument about whether or not um, Stella Blade's boobs physics, in particular, respond to uh, going up and down ladders, was realistic. <laughs> there was a person who was adamant that the way they were moving was 100% realistic. And someone was like, my brother, you've never seen boobs if you think that that's what they do. I'm going to have um, to go and, and it- look up a video of love uh, Stella Blade boobs are going up ladders now. And then speak to... Uh- yeah, speak to some I mean, women and see if they see if they agree that they're realistic. I have to say, it is fascinating timing. Like in this sort of post Sweet Baby Ink social media environment we live in, where you can go on Twitter any day of the week and still find an argument flaring up around any number of things. The fact that like a major AAA uh, game being published by by so being published by Sony themselves is coming out later this month that has just the most egregious use of big t physics that we've seen in some time i think it's kind of I mean, it's very funny timing and i'm, I'm not is I'm, it, I'm, i think there's room for both see i think there's room for oh, uh, maybe no, i'm, I'm, I'm i think there's room for big big sweet baby oh, I, I, and, I, I, and i think there's room for big booby jizzle phys- jiggle physics in games absolutely. i think i think let the gamers decide like let them let them decide with their wallets and if you um you know you and do you know what i think both will be successful and i think that's the way it should be you should i think pe- gamers should be uh you know uh appealed to however they find themselves i don't think yeah. there's i don't think there's any room for one thing no I, that, I i was purely commenting on like my fascination with the timing oh no, I know, I, know, I, know, no I know i know i know you like, I, i'm I know you i'm were. i'm 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 pro titties uh just <laughs> surprise if anyone surprise. If, if anyone needed that on the record if i if I've, I've got them jonesy it would be it would be unfair of me to um to lambast them but i do, I do um, think we both agreed though that this they've done too much in this don't they? they they feel like they went slightly too jiggly so they they up that they they had the slider for the size of the size and the jiggle and they just they went yeah. a few notches too far that it's ever it is ever so slightly distracting i i thought anyway i don't want to put words in your mouth i think they maybe well, should have edged the slider back a touch just to just to take the edge off perhaps perhaps i think my 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 feelings on the uh, on a, 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 in some respects deeply flawed themselves because I think that there are other um, examples of games that have moved in that direction perhaps not as like explicitly especially when it comes to the physics but like when we were talking about this kind of thing before the podcast went live like I was talking about Bayonetta and the idea that Bayonetta both as you know as a as a series and as a character through certain you know narrative elements and game design elements justifies what bayonetta and like so i talked about the fact that the high high heels are integrated into the suits of these soldiers in stellar blade and i'm like you could that's a bit eye rolly but then uh, but then on the flip side i'm like yeah but bayonetta justifies the fact that she has high heels because they have guns in them and because like it's more exaggerated and she does all these cool tricks and fl- and, and like, i don't know so i i my my feelings on the whole matter are probably the further you get into it, probably quite contradictory. And so I, it, maybe it's easy just to not say anything, but like, <laughs> Fair. I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm a big near automata fan. And like, the, the, there are, there are things about near that, like you can position certain cameras in certain ways and get good looks at things that you didn't necessarily need to get good looks at as a part of the, the game experience. But most of us who played it did. Um, and that's, and I, I put it to one side because Nier Automata is bigger than that. Like Nier, Nier Automata becomes m- more important and more poignant than the fact that you know there are sometimes some 
pretty egregious shots of asses in there if you position the camera the right way. <laughs> um, and I don't know if Stellar Blade is going to you know reach that threshold yet. I guess. Yeah, one one to keep our eyes on. Yeah, <laughs> actually, technically, Jesse, there are two to keep your eyes on. Um, it's better that way. Yeah. Um, oh, do you know how loves tits? I'm guessing he just gives me that impression. I would have said he's more of an ass man, but go for it. Okay. Well, well, uh, let us know in the comments down below. Phil Spencer is the man we're talking about. Do you think he's team ass or team tits? Uh, chime in. One thing we do know, though, Josie, is that he is pro-choice. And I'm not talking about in a political sense. I'm talking about in a video game sense when it comes to the video games that people can play and where they can play them. And as such, he's been making some very interesting statements in that aforementioned interview with Polygon that he did just as GDC was coming to an end. Um, he talked about a bunch of stuff, Jonesy. We, we kind of skimmed over some of it last week. Like he did make a couple of quotes about a potential Xbox handheld and things like that. But... Generally speaking, a lot of the statements that he was making, if you kind of broke them down to their core, kind of their core parts, their building blocks, were about having people being able to play more games in more places. And one of the ways he is potentially entertaining that idea is by opening the door, theoretically, for other digital storefronts like Epic Games or Itch.io, um, for example, to come to Xbox. Um, I've got some quotes, actually, from the man himself, if you want to hear a little bit more about what he had to, uh, has to say. He said, consider our history as the Windows company, talking, of course, about Microsoft. Nobody would blink twice if I said, hey, when you're using a PC, you get to decide the type of experience you have by picking where to buy games. There's real value in that. Obviously, referring to the fact that, like, unsurprisingly people are used to the fact that you own a pc that's your platform but where you buy your games whether it's steam or epic game store or any various publishers proprietary game stores up to you and there's another quote if i want to play on a gaming pc then i feel like i'm a more continuous part of a gaming ecosystem as a whole he said as opposed to on console where my gaming is kind of sharded to use a gaming term based on these different closed ecosystems that i have to play across sometimes even like physically so right this idea that um you know if you want to go from one game to another you might be switching off a console and picking up and turning on an entirely different console he clearly seems keen to get away um from that idea now obviously the uh, the asterisk next to all of this is i don't think sony or nintendo uh, <laughs> are keen on that uh, those similar no. ideas at all so when it comes to xbox's plans and phil spencer's kind of vision for all of this what, like, what do you make of it all, and what do you think this could end up looking like? Uh, we've talked um, at length, you know, in recently about the fact that Xbox have have opened up about you know being third in the console wars, and the fact that they've you know not done as well as they would have hoped. And effectively, I think last year Phil Spencer saying that um, they have to accept you know their fate of where they're at hardware wise. Um, and I think he's probably being. I, I I think the thing about him these days is he's very open. He's very honest. It, it seems. Um, and I think he's when he talks about things like this, he's attempting to say like, how do Xbox square that circle of saying like, hey, look, we're we're a distant third. How do we how do we improve on that position? And I think making things from uh, ma making other. Um, digital storefronts available on the xbox i think yeah it makes sense like why would you why would you gatekeep um other games from your system if it's going to help push your system to other people i mean blimey especially if you were talking about steam and and a microsoft are a company that could probably make it happen as well like as he said they're microsoft they're not a company that yeah. are going to have um as much trouble integrating you know their tech and stuff but then but at the same time it, it's almost like I think you do move further and further away from Xbox first party software if you do that. I think you start to introduce other um competitors onto your hardware uh mm -hmm. which is and you you lose control absolutely like if you if let's say Steam for example if you put Steam onto the Xbox you've lost control of what games are coming to your system and how they're going to run and you you lose all of that. Sony are uh, famous for like you know being really strict about games and how they function and stuff on the playstation and the fact that they why cyberpunk was such a big deal was because sony don't give refunds because hey games shouldn't be mm. that shitty on the playstation yeah. they're going to need to do that but xbox saying that hey we'll blow this thing wide open let anyone play on the xbox with any storefront 
seems yeah. really good also seems really dangerous seems like a good move for the future also seems like it could be the last hurrah like i don't know if i'm i'm, I'm so confused as to what it what i think yeah it means. I, i'm confused by it as well because it, like you talk about something like the epic game store coming to xbox as a platform and you know of course it gives users and consumers more choice and there's other storefronts and maybe it, like, maybe it increases competition and you therefore like you end up in weird situations where you might be circumventing kind of like pl uh, storefront exclusivity by the fact that you just have access to these storefronts but then the other problem i'm thinking is that xbox as a platform whether you're no matter which console you're talking about specifically it is still a console it does still have specific demands and so it almost doesn't matter the, the thing that matters more to me is less which games are being sold on a platform and who buy and at what prices and and and, and what, what value that represents to the consumer but also but more more so which games are being made for the xbox like if if phil spencer you know opens up the wind open opens up that door and all these storefronts pour onto the uh, xbox and now people who own a Series X, for example, don't just have to go to the Xbox store to buy a digital game. They can buy digital games from anywhere. Those digital games still need to be games that a developer said, yes, we're going to make an Xbox version of that game. If, if some major developer or publisher next year says, we're not going to make an Xbox version, like the, there's still no Xbox version. You can have as many storefronts as you want. A game that's not on Xbox is a game that's not on Xbox. What, that, what about if, like what about if Xbox actually make an Xbox, which is basically a PC, running a version of well, Windows that, yeah, and then in the background, which allows you to. But but then you've made a fake PC. Yes. With a different name. Yes. Which maybe that is the end goal, but I, I don't know. And then you get into stuck in weird stuff like, what if there was a deal where like. You know, a, a company that also had a cloud infrastructure that was quite solid, like Steam, came across, and there was a Steam launcher on Xbox where you could play, but you didn't play the games natively. You played them almost as like an extension of X. I, I don't even know. Like maybe something like that could. But like for me, like the bigger issue is, is this game coming out on Xbox? Yes or no? And having an extra digital storefront isn't going to help you with that. No, no. If if that is literally the if it is the case of. The games that you already know and love and whatever you want to play on Xbox, but you're just going to have to buy them through a different storefront. That, to me, just seems like adding... That's why I don't think it can be that, because that's just adding red tape to buying games, which is annoying. Or unless unless what they're going for is more the idea of, um, you know, the EA, the UBs, the, the subscriptions. So you can subscribe to Epic, and then you can have, you know, stuff from the Epic Game Store. But that, again, I don't know. It just None of this seems that relevant unless you're talking about to my mind, effectively allowing other companies to, um, but then then you would have to change the hardware. You would have to have a hardware which run which is effectively a fake PC, like as as you know as we said, so, so that you can run those other stores because otherwise they're just Xbox games anyway. They're coming to Xbox, so what's the problem? Um, yeah, it's a it's a weird one. It's a weird one. It it is weird. The whole thing's a weird one. And I'll be honest, like when you put these quotes alongside all the other quotes that Bill Spencer gave during GDC and a lot of the other interviews that he's given you know, across the last year or two, so maybe 18 months. I'm not going to suggest that the Xbox game plan seems confusing because um, uh, I'm sure that there are you know, you know, plenty of you know, very firm ideas on the Xbox side and there are a lot of plenty of very clear documentation that outlines exactly what they're going for. But th there does seem to be an element of... Um, Phil Spencer essentially saying yes to anything that opens up more revenue streams because fundamentally <laughs> Xbox are in a position where Microsoft are looking at their gaming division and they're saying, right, well, you're not winning the console race. You're not, you know, you're not generating, you know, hit first party exclusive software. You know, Game Pass subscriber subscriptions have slowed down. Where's the money coming from? And Phil is in a position and where, you know, he's trying to answer that question. I suppose the problem is, and, and I don't know how you see this, but there is a very fine line between saying yes to all these different revenue streams and opening up all these different ways to make the Xbox brand more popular, more profitable, or even just generate more revenue, and throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks, you know? <laughs> and which 
it, if taken to the nth degree, could end up being damaging to a brand where it's like, oh yeah, the, that's Xbox. The the guys who they're putting their games out on everything. You can play everything on it, but actually they've become a jack of all trades, master of none because their vision was how can we make money, not what does our platform look like. I, I yeah yeah I'm totally with you. Like I hadn't I hadn't really thought about it like that, but we've often talked about how Xbox are. They might not be winning uh, the battle, but like they're winning the war because they've got all these great ideas and they're doing that. They, you know, they do. They seem to be a lot more pro gamer. They seem to be trying to make their games playable more places. But as time goes on, it does seem to be a little bit more like, yeah, chucking shit at a wall. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's it's fascinating how quickly the sentiment around Xbox changed from that um, losing the battle, winning the war kind of idea that a lot of people were talking about a couple of years ago. And you think about even to you know this point last year, where yeah, Phil Spencer was giving interviews, but Phil Spencer was giving interviews in the aftermath of Redfall being a disappointment, yeah. and talking about how maybe that was going to change to how hands on or hands hands off they were with the studios they were acquiring, and you still had this very clear idea in your head of like. Xbox were spending, oh, and, and Microsoft were spending a lot of money. They were bringing all these, studi these studios. They were r vastly increasing the number of first-party exclusives they were going to be producing. They were therefore vastly strengthening the um, the the, uh, the the idea of something a service like Game Pass. And that in in the in a few years or in a few generations, whichever comes first, when home consoles are less important, Xbox is going to be the champion to the world because everyone's going to be a part of their ecosystem. And now, a year later, 18 months later, it's like, actually, the video games industry is on fire and Xbox are the, the doing the and do, are suffering for them at the most. The, co yeah. the company that just bought Activision Blizzard King for, like, the biggest video game acquisition of all time, by some margin, are, within months of that deal closing, the most on fire of the big three console manufacturers. It's, it's, it's odd. Um... And I, and I don't know how it's gonna. I don't know how it's gonna shake out. I really don't know. Um, no, m me either. I, I had to laugh because uh, in chat, Classy Cat has just called me out, and it's fair. It says, "Please, Xbox being pro gamer is like saying Disney being immoral. They're companies that are willing to sell you anything to get the monopoly of cash." I'm like, yeah. But when well, I say yeah. when I say pro gamer, I suppose what I mean is like there are some companies that almost seem to be anti gamer at the uh, as long as their vision and their name is is how positive to their how they think of themselves as being positive like they would do things that actively seem to be negative for their companies it just to spite themselves because they think it's like good for them which i think playstation would do at least with xbox it seemed like they were kind of going the opposite way and like phil spencer was saying things that seemed to make sense like not so let's, let's not say pro gamer let's say like they weren't cutting off their nose to spite their face but it does seem like they've they're going they're going further, and the problem they're facing, I think, as you said, Jamie, is they've spent a hell of a lot of money. But if they don't see the returns on investment that they need to, it doesn't matter if they get amazing returns. If they're not getting enough um, return on investment, um, then it doesn't bode well for the future. And then and, and then plans will change. Plans will have to change. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that they are probably feeling the impacts of overall industry trends and an overall slowdown in growth, maybe even like a flatline in growth of the industry. And they're looking at it and saying, well, like the industry as a, as a whole isn't generating more revenue. It's, you know, the home console market isn't attracting more consumers. Um, but you you, made, you made the great point last week. You made a fantastic point last week, which was people love to tout the figures of uh, like the video games is is the biggest industry in the media by far, like you know um, massive trillions of dollars in the gaming industry. And then it was like, well, actually, console market makes up like a f t small fraction of that. But if you take out mobile gaming, uh, yeah. all of the side stuff. So actually, when you're Xbox and you're looking at how much money is available to you and how much you're spending on these massive companies to buy them and to purchase them yeah suddenly the the pie doesn't look quite so big yeah and suddenly you know being uh, a a, rele a a relevant player in the cloud gaming market to s at least see where that goes seems relevant and having services that like remember there were those rumors where you know xbox apparently wanted to get a game pass app on the switch and you think about something like that with hindsight and you're like yeah of course they were like because i i don't think quote unquote losing the console 
battle war, but like whatever you want to put it, has necessarily been a disaster um, for Xbox, largely because they are a part of Microsoft, and Microsoft are like a three trillion dollar company. They're one of the biggest companies in the world. I think sometimes the biggest company in the world in terms of market uh, cap and stuff like that. Um, but you know, at, at some point, it, there's a, it, it only it only makes it only makes so much sense for a company like that to be in last place for a certain amount of time. Um, the Xbox brand holds a lot of you know weight and relevance in the market, um, but how they try and exploit that in the future, like at this point, I know this we're kind of talking around the same things, but like nothing would surprise me, as was the case that we kind of found ourselves in a couple of months ago when all these rumors came out around Xbox's uh, changes and plans when it came to exclusivity um, and a new strategy to potentially um, bring more of their uh, once exclusive titles to other platforms. Obviously, they kind of pumped the brakes a little bit and essentially soft launched it with four titles that they made, you know, unique cases for and for, for each. Um, and generally speaking, I think xbox fans were okay with it in the end there were some people getting very over dramatic on twitter but they kind of they quietened down phil has shared a little bit shed a little bit more light on that new exclusivity strategy although surprisingly jonesy uh, i don't know if this is going to catch you off guard he's suggesting that it could be down to gen z consumer behavior um i can elaborate if, if, if you'd like me to <laughs> go on um, he said that this this notion that Xbox can only be this one device that plugs into a television isn't something we see in the Gen Z research because nothing else is like that for them. Some of them will have an iPhone, some will have an Android, but all the games and everything is the same. I can still get to TikTok on both of them, at least for now. So he's almost looking at this this younger generation of um of consumers that are, uh, like, like, I guess, primarily, almost, it's not a very kind word to use, but are almost being trained on how certain markets work by um, the smart by, by smartphones. And he is almost right that, like, you know, there, there's not, there's, we don't see a lot of app exclusivity between iOS and Android, for example, or and and we so we see no app exclusivity when it comes to like different models of phone. There, you know, there's not an amazing mobile game that you need to own a Samsung phone to 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 play. And so maybe he's su suggesting that there's a whole generation of consumers raised on those kinds of beliefs and that maybe when they get to the point where they are looking at or considering entering the console market, they're like, hang on a second, if I want to play a Halo and a an Uncharted, those are two really antiquated examples, but you know what I mean, I have to buy this console and... Oh. With, uh... He's only thinking... Oh, Sorry, well, you, 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 you froze. Lose. You froze I was going to say, I understand why Phil thinks that way, but again, the only reason he's thinking that way is because he is the, the not the face of, but he is the public-facing representative of the worst-selling console with the worst-selling exclusives, um, and 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 they're having to adjust to the difficulties they're having in a market that suits Nintendo just fine. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm kind of torn with this. So the uh, the notion of like, we have to appeal to Gen Z. I'm like, yeah, of course you do. They're, they're the current, uh, you know, young adult generation. Like they're the ones who are, who are going to be, um, who you can capture, right? You, you've got millennials and to a lesser degree, probably like Gen X are already kind of set in their ways. If someone's a PlayStation player, they're, they're, they're going to keep buying PlayStation. Xbox can keep buying Xbox. I would argue. Um, I think Nintendo kind of sits outside of that. I think you can, you can buy a switch and and because it's cheap this is the thing a switch is cheaper it fills a different niche it's a handheld blah 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 blah. so you so it doesn't kind of fit into the same area gen z i would argue maybe there's a lot more to play for because you've still got people who aren't necessarily wedded to one console or the other yet so i think he's absolutely right that um that they need to appeal to gen z consumers i don't really uh I don't really follow the logic of his. They're like, oh, apps work on an Android and they also work on an iPhone. Therefore, why would why would one work and one on not work on the other? I'm like, people are in are more loyal to phones than they ever were to consoles. Like, there'd be people with an iPhone that would like rip an Android user and vice versa. I don't think that's I think that's like a weird comparison to make. I think people don't 
they would never know if you could get an Android version of an app that they use on an iPhone because they're never going to touch an Android phone. Like, and something, some paradigm shift would have to happen before they ever swapped over to a different, you know, a different type. Um, yeah. In my experience, um, I think the the problem they have and what they really need to do is to say like, how do we appeal to the potential gamers, the Gen Z gamers who currently don't have a console, who aren't wedded to one, and what do we do to appeal to those specific as consumers? And I think PlayStation have a lot better offering at the moment because it's they have this sexy, uh, high-end home entertainment system, which isn't just a console. It also does all this other stuff. It's like a... But an Xbox is more of like, it seems anyway, more of like a hard and fast gaming machine that's powerful and you can game on it. Whereas I just think they need to have more of an appealing product. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really agree with this idea of yeah. everything has to work everywhere. No, I agree. Like it's another case of a statement that Phil has made that you kind of uh, scrutinise a little bit. You're like, what exactly are you saying here? Because it, you know, like, when you talk about exclusivity, again, PlayStation and Nintendo aren't shifting their strategies on exclusivity and iota anytime soon. Xbox are the ones who are you know, trying to find a solution to the problem they're having. The only thing you can do when you're Xbox is say, well, what if we take our exclusive products and put them on other platforms? That, in my mind, just strengthens those other platforms and weakens yours. Yes. If, you're in a, if you're in a world where Phil's now like, okay, do you know what? We're running out of ideas. Let's put Starfield on PlayStation for, because that's what Gen Z want. You haven't made the Xbox brand stronger. Yes, you you've put an Xbox published pro- a Microsoft, an Xbox game studio product in the hands of more people. And maybe if that's your end game at the end of the day, then great. But if that's your end game, that suggests that again you are essentially out of the console market. Yeah. Because putting uh, again, you could go around in weird circles like we did a couple of months ago when we were talking about putting a game on PlayStation and making the sequel exclusive to Xbox. We're, but I don't think Xbox are in a position to play 4D chess like that. Like, I, I I, don't see how that strengthens the Xbox's position as a console manufacturer. It might strengthen the Xbox brand marginally, but it also just makes decisions easier for the people who are at that fork in the road where they have to choose which console they want to buy. Oh, I like all the PlayStation exclusives, and also I'm going to get a good chunk of the Xbox ones at all. Compared to if I get an Xbox, I get none of what Nintendo <laughs> or PlayStation put out. Yeah. Um, so, Which, but then you get to, uh, then you do get to a weird space of, of like ending up. And we've said this before: Xbox, if they just became a software um, publisher at the end of the day, they could end up doing fantastically well because all their games are everywhere and and they make a load of money. But that remains to be seen. I I still think. The real problem Xbox have got is that uh, is that exclusives on the Xbox have not been great for a long time, no. and and even though they haven't been great for the PlayStation Five from Sony for you know for a, a number of years, memories are long when it comes to gaming, and and gamers have fond memories of things. And when you look at the era of of Spider Man Two, of The Last of Us, of God of War. Um, you know, and and then all the third party games, which would which were very very good at the same time, you could also play on the PlayStation. I think it's you know you have to get over that. And the problem Xbox for me have got now today is that they need to nail some absolutely phenomenal Xbox first party games that are on the Xbox. Yep. And and that you know that's that's just what they need to do. The I- irony, yep. the irony as well of that is, um, because Xbox are Microsoft, part of their problem is even if they did have a phenomenal game that was amazing and really good to play, a lot of people would immediately say, yeah, but the best place to play is PC. So you, already yes, you yeah. kind of eat half of your your market because you're like, yeah, but you can also play on a PC. And people don't, well, I don't, I don't immediately think PC and think Microsoft because I might be running Windows, but I don't have a Microsoft PC. Like I've, I've got a PC. The fact that it's operating system is Microsoft, it doesn't really go together. And that, I mean, don't get me wrong. Microsoft have made a hell of a lot of money from me over the years because of yeah. all my operating systems with Microsoft. But I don't think people put those things together when it comes to actual, like, uh, um, you know, um, consumer allegiance. 
I don't think you think of it in the same way as you think Xbox. Like, I've got a Mac and I've got a PC. I've got Windows and I've got OS. Like, I don't really, I don't care one way or the other about those two things. But I really do care about PlayStation, Xbox. And for me, it all comes down to Xbox need more really high-end first-party games only available on the Xbox. So when I come to get the Xbox next gen or the PlayStation 6, I genuinely have a tough decision to make. Yeah, they need to put you in the position that you would have been in around 2000 and I'm going to say seven where you would have been sat there. You'd have had a PlayStation three. You'd have played games like lair and Hayes. Yes. They were doing me wrong. There were some good ones, but I'm just picking out a couple for play, fun. Played both and, of those. Yeah. And you would have been sat there wondering, I wonder what it's like to be able to play, you know, the Elder Scrolls four oblivion and gears of war. And uh, even things that were exclusives at first that people don't remember exclusives like Mass Effect and Dead Rising and Saints Row and Halo 3. D- Dead, you've nailed it. For, you've nailed a couple of mine. Gears of War and Dead Rising were two uh, two um, fra- f- franchises that that genuinely made me question what I was my thinking. They were the mm. ones that made me go because I would see people playing them. I would play them at friends' houses, and I was like, "Damn, these are good." Um, and it, it wasn't quite enough then to like you know to make me cross the Rubicon, but it, it, though you need those games, you need those titles, you need those franchises. Yep. And I just kind of feel like they just don't have them at the moment. The irony is that Sony don't seem to either. But the difference is, is that while Sony don't and um, and Microsoft don't or Xbox don't, it actually doesn't matter to to PlayStation and Sony because if they don't have them and Microsoft don't have them, people are just going to buy another PlayStation if that's what they already have. Because they'll be like, oh, I, I had a PlayStation last time. You need to give yeah. them that that tough choice. No, you, you absolutely do. You absolutely do. And the, the the last thing I'll say about the Gen Z element is that Phil makes a somewhat interesting point looking at the mobile market. But there's another market that I think, and you can maybe speak to this as someone with kids. I don't know what generation they technically are. Probably the one alpha. after. There you go, Alpha. Gen Alpha, yeah. But, but one thing, Gen, Gen Z consumers might know phones and, and mobile devices very well, but the other thing I think they know very well are streaming services because yes. they, watch, they watch or they consume a lot of content. Even if you want to add like, you know, YouTube and, and streaming platforms into that as well. And one thing that they are all still about is exclusivity. You sign, like, some people will sign up to Netflix, yes, because like, I don't know, they just want to watch the... I, the, the friends or so, I, I don't know like, there's but but like there's a reason that netflix and apple and you know amazon and all these companies still pump hundreds of millions of dollars a year into original programming that is exclusive to their platforms because content is king and in a world where not everyone can't be subscribed to every surface serve uh, uh, service you, at some point, you choose Netflix over Disney Plus or whatever because of, of the quality of the programming that is unique to that service. I, yeah, you've nailed it, and a fantastic point. And one thing that actually is interesting at the moment, and I think that your um, uh, that your point goes to one hundred percent, is every conversation I've had with people recently about streaming services is not what streaming service are they going to sign up to next. It is what streaming service are they going to cancel next. Yeah, because so many people I know, and I'm one of them, signed up to like all of them, um, because you want to watch this show, you want to watch that show. We've now gotten used to that, the the world as it is now, this new paradigm of everyone has their own goddamn streaming service, and actually, what we're starting to do is to say, no, we need to we need to pair back because I'm I've not watched anything on Apple TV for a year, I've not watched anything on Paramount yep. for like for a year. Um, and and people keep saying to me like, yeah, I recently cancelled this. I recently cancelled that. The only reason I still have Netflix is because the deal I've got on this. Or the only reason I still have that is because this series and my kids watch it. Um, and I think you're right. I think that it it all boils down to why are you sticking with that service? And it seemed like Xbox knew that, and so that they were going for we're going to have amazing games and we're going to make them available everywhere. So that Game Pass was this incredible offering because it's where all the games are. We we'll get loads of money. But then it now seems like they've just they we thought they were playing 4d chess and actually what they were really doing was going out ah, like you said we don't know what we're doing so we're just going to try a bit of everything which yeah we, we've got pressure from the people above us to make money um and we're not doing it through all the conventional means so yeah and, and for, unfortunately for xbox playstation whilst they haven't had a great you know 
it's not been as phenomenal as it could have been with the PlayStation 5. They do have a number of irons in the fire that they could pull out and just and suddenly get everyone screaming and hollering. Um, you know, like yep. you talk about uh, getting another um, uh, Last of Us game, another Ratchet and Clank, um, you know, a follow up to Spider Man. Like, there's a whole Ghost bunch of stuff. Tsushima. Go, another Ghost of Tsushima. That you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff they can they can do. Um, they don't need to do much. Like, they don't need to do 20, 30 games. They can do like five, and people are gonna ho- hoot and holler. And it seems yeah. like Xbox are further away from that reality at the moment. Unfortunately for them, they certainly are. And you know, cover your ears if you're listening, Phil, but it's not going to get any easier when it comes to picking out the, the kinds of games that are going to make an impact um, on gamers' playtimes, if nothing else, in the future. Because, um, well, we, we, we mentioned Sony there and the decisions they can take. It's interesting that you and I still focus a lot on sort of like single player, narrative driven, traditional AAA video games. But live service games continues to be a battlefield that a lot of people, um, a lot of companies are fighting on because when it comes to capturing gamers' attentions for longer periods of times, that is still where the biggest wins are to be found, but also where the biggest losses are to be had if you get it wrong. Uh, in fact, speaking of Sony, at one point in time, uh, it was uh, stated that they were aiming to launch over 10 new live service <laughs> games in a certain window of time. Um and I think it didn't take long before there was reporting that that number had halved. Um, and that is representative of just how difficult it is to break through when you're making new games like that. And one of the things that we have now to back up um, such an assertion is um, a new report, which comes from a company called Newzu, And it is their second annual PC and console gaming report, which includes data analyzing player trends, highlighting how playtime has shrunk, and is focused on a smaller number of games. Basically, bad news if you're in the games industry in just about any capacity, unless you make one of these games. People are playing games for less time, and the number of games they are playing um, is shrinking. Here's the other thing, though, about the games that they're playing, Jonesy, is that they're getting older and older. Um, Analyzing the percentage of total hours spent on games by release date, 61% of total hours were spent on games six years old and over with newer releases and they quantify that as anything released inside the last three years accounting for just 23 percent of time now of course time spent in a game isn't everything there are plenty of games out there that are extremely profitable that aren't aiming to capture as many player hours as possible but we do talk a lot about ecosystems we talk a lot about live service games we talk a lot about you know, microtransactions, one thing we do know is that there is a large amount of money in becoming one of these games. Uh, games like Fortnite, Roblox, League of Legends, Minecraft, and GTA V. I, they I, were the, I don't the think, top I think... five games highlighted. Sorry. S- sorry, let me talk over you. Um, Roblox shouldn't be in there. That like Roblox isn't a game. That's, I find that bizarre. That's, that's been put in there. That's... I mean, on paper, it kind of is, though. It's a game that allows you to make other other games. Like it's a it's storefront. A, it's, it's a, a Roblox. U, it's is a, a UGC. No, nah, it's it's a, it's a UGC driven video game. No, it's not even. It's nowhere near that. It's literally a storefront. It's it's a. What does? Actually, I was looking it up. Do you know how Roblox described themselves? Go An immersive it. platform for communication and connection. Uh, okay, I okay, a plat- Yeah, platform. Sure. Um, I would I would argue storefront, but like there's no way in which anyone who has never seen Ro I think there's a lot of people out there the misconception that Roblox is like a game like Fortnite. It is not that at all. Roblox is is couldn't be more different. Like it isn't a coherent universe with a couple of like different branches. It is literally a shitty collection of crappy models uh, utilized by lots of people to make terrible terrible mini games that are that are devoid of any creativity that children play and and hidden in there there are some very very good games that are made by people who have put love effort and time i don't want to diminish those people but 90 percent of the stuff that i've seen played watch kids play seen how many thousands because this thing on the front page of roblox it says like this many thousands of people are playing this game and it's got a 90 percent like like user like uh rating that is not a game when you can see that from the front page and you can hop in and play totally different games that have got nothing to do with one another. I mean, it's a storefront. 
I didn't mean to. I, 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 I digress, man. I'm, I've ruined it. I, I agree and disagree. It's interesting. Like I don't know if you, when the last time you played Fortnite was, but Fortnite is trending in that direction. Like, oh, okay. Fortnite does now open to like all these like almost like YouTube style squares that are, like here's this user made game mode where like it's Squid Game in Fortnite, you know, or oh, whatever. The last time I saw you, I played Fortnite. It was. Um... It was after they'd obviously released Lego and the driving modes. Well, yeah, so you've seen it, and because those are those are games within a game. That's Fortnite as a platform. I said, because they still before, seem to have a theme. To though, before, it still had a theme. Do you know what I mean? It still had some connective tissue. I mean, Roblox technically has connective oh, tissue. Oh yeah, maybe it does. I suppose you still have your same cat. You still have a character with the same skin that kind of covered. Yeah, I suppose maybe it I does, mean, man. Maybe it does. Regardless, though, the picture being painted here is one that is becoming. Uh, uh, it's dicier and dicier if you are committed to developing a certainly a live service game that is trying to penetrate the kind of audiences that are playing games like Roblox and Fortnite, League of Legends, Minecraft, GTA 5. Because not only are the majority of games that we're all playing apparently at least six years old or older, but also average playtimes are going down uh, when listed by quarter. Um, now, this is uh, at least somewhat attributed to a, a dip following the pandemic boom. But playtime uh, is down 26% since Q1 2021. Um, that is not... Oh, that, yeah, that... That time... It's, it was not, it's not surprising. That time was mad. Like, everyone I know but, was logging again, in every week to play. That's... Yeah. But again, like, when we're talking about an industry where game development times and costs are such that you need to map these things out however far in advance. Right. If you, like... If you were if you were greenlighting or signing off on a game in 2020 or 2021, and these were the numbers you were getting back in 2023, they'd be bring, painting a pretty scary picture, depending on the kind of game you wanted to make. Yes, that is so true. Um, and and we've seen we've seen the reality of that last year and this year with the redundancies because they were they were like, oh look at the the market's gone crazy. We should sink so much money into it, and then it was like, oh no, the reality is now we're going to fire you know 10 percent of the entirety of our workforce. Yeah, I mean, we talk, we talked about Sony. Like, we uh, obviously there were workforce repercussions there, but for them it was pretty black and white. Like, they they were like, live service is the future. We want at least X amount of these projects in this time. We were sat there watching um, that Sony showcase or coming up on a year ago now, where we all wanted to see you know this, that, and the other. We all wanted to see you know, the single player games that they were working on. And instead we were watching it like we were seeing fail safes and, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, marathon and, oh, I forget what, I, the, the, I forget what the other one was called. Concord. Concord. Um, yeah. And all these, it's like, get ready. These are the live service games. And then before we knew it, that, that list had, had supposedly halved games that we never even saw the light of day, like the, the last of us multiplayer project completely canned. Um, it's it I, i'm wondering now and there's a part of me that is almost licking my lips at the prospect uh, that people are if people look at surveys like this and reports like this and maybe put your game dev or game publisher hat on and tell me what you think and saying like right okay people are spending less time playing games not much we can do about that we're not gonna have another global pandemic anytime soon people are, are committed to or oh, okay you raise your <laughs> eyebrows may we're probably not gonna have one anytime soon fingers crossed yeah. fingers crossed people are, are spending their time playing a very small amount of games and they're games that they're familiar with and they've been playing with for playing for a long time they're they're familiar and they're comfortable everyone's got their their fortnite or their minecraft or their gta that they just go back to and what you're probably seeing is that it's incredibly incredibly hard to penetrate um that market in fact there's a stat here that um new games competed for just eight percent of total playtime in 2023 um so you're looking at that and say you must be thinking well playtime is at an all-time premium but sales are still possible you can still release a game that people are only meant to play for 20, 30, 40 hours and then never play again. So, of course, you're not going to register on these surveys. And you can still sell 5 million units, 10 million units, 15 million units. If you're, let's say, a Sony, does that push you not just away from live service where there's you know an increasing risk and it's becoming more and more of this walled garden that you can't hop over, but further into the more single-player 
traditional um you know tri- triple a games that uh, some at various points it's almost like a yo-yo some people there are like they're, they're selling more than ever then they're dead then they're selling more than ever then then they're dead are they is it is are they back in in fashion are they so hot right now i it's really hard to know i the so what this says to me if i was trying to guess what they would be thinking is you want to be one of those big games that you read out in six years time that people are still playing because the people are still putting money into it you want to be roblox league of legends minecraft gta 5 for yes um sure you if don't you can if you can but you what you can't do is know if you're going to make one of those games so right what i what i would guess is that the way to do it if i was if you know if this was me if i had my own company and i was i, I was sony my my move would be would be to make the best single player uh, you know smaller multiplayer games um i possibly can the, to the highest quality to appeal to our player base whilst at the same time trying to develop and put out um the next Fortnite, the next minecraft you know so i would be i would be still looking at what's what's new what's fresh what's interesting what what's happening online what the gen z the gen alphas the sort of stuff they're looking at like i would be looking at those because a lot of these things like minecraft what's interesting is minecraft um roblox and even like Fortnite to a lesser extent kind of came out of nowhere as low budget um games they weren't super high budget long-term development titles um so the reality grew into what they are today it, absolutely like fortnite was never supposed to be what fortnite is fortnite was a different game that had this mode attached to it and that mode became the thing that turned into the goliath um yeah. so it's almost like and i tell this to, this is so funny because i tell this to people all the time when it comes to like our industry like video production and online online video i'm like you cannot plan for a viral the idea that you're going to say we'll just make a viral video game that is non-existent the only thing you can do is make the best thing you can make and just and keep making the best thing you can make and one of those things might turn into something amazing but keep your options open that's the only i think that's the only thing you can do if you're sony if you're xbox whoever you are because as you said you can't plan for a pandemic you can't plan for this you can't plan for that but you can learn too much you can read this and say eight percent total sales or eight percent total play time of 2023 was on new games therefore there's no point making any new games you could do that but again only if you're going for playtime and only if you're trying to penetrate that you know that big group of games that are constantly played do you think though that they're like if you are more risk averse then all of a sudden games that aren't designed that are designed to sell a lot but not necessarily be played for a long time become a less risky option and all of a sudden it's like you look at something like spider-man we talked about that spider-man multiplayer game that got cancelled sony looked at two things one of them is a online multiplayer live service driven spider-man game with microtransactions that we want the average player to play for 200 hours because our 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 stats tell us after they play for 200 hours they're 17 percent more likely to spend three dollars and if three three percent of the player base spends three dollars then we've generated x amount of revenue which oh and then someone else says yeah, but I've also got this graph over here that says if you just make Spider-Man 3 and it gets at least an 85 on Metacritic, you're guaranteed 15 million units. Yeah, so that, that's what I'm saying. So just make good stuff. Like, make good stuff as well as you can make it um, and give it, you know, give it the time, give it all of that, sort of, give it the love and everything. That's all you can do is make stuff as well as you can, realistically. Yeah. And then, and like I said, keep your options open for the next big thing that might come along. And if someone says to you, Oh, there's this there's this new weird thing that's been made by this small little company over there, and you then you Xbox it and you go buy them. If if that's really what you're yeah, gonna do, yeah. you just go buy that. If if you think it's making moves and you can see it before anyone else can, and you're the industry insiders, yeah, go buy them. Like, but keep making yeah. the big high end, blah 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 blah. Don't make Suicide I mean, Squad. Like, that, don't that try. Is the, uh, the, yes, I, I feel like more and more companies will, companies will learn that lesson. And it's funny you mentioned Minecraft, like Minecraft and all this chat about Xbox. That is the ironic thing about the quote unquote big five that we keep referring to is that the only one of them that's owned by one of the console manufacturers is Minecraft, and that's Xbox. Yeah. Because <laughs> they went and bought it. Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting. Um, 
Well, Josie, unless you've got anything else to add. Uh, I would say, so, okay, what, one thought I had as you were saying it. Yeah. I think there is, there is, a, uh, there's scope for hope when we talk about this sort of stuff. <laughs> oh, God. Get that, that's a hashtag waiting to trend. I tell you why. Because there's so much, so much of like online, of X, of all that sort of stuff, of whatever, is, is like, oh, everything's everything's known everything is a big conspiracy everything they know all of they we're all controlled we don't make any decisions and all this and then you just have to look at something like this and you go do you know what the biggest games companies in the world have no goddamn idea what they're doing because people are so hard to predict and yeah. and for all the algorithms that people like to talk about for all the t- the uh, watch time and for the uh, you know keeping people on your app and all that kind of crap that they talk about uh, in our industries and oh, for yeah. all this bull- bullshit that people tell you, they can keep you on their app for days and you can't leave because you're controlled. It's like, n- none of that is true. It's it's the scene in Wolf of Wall Street where Matthew McConaughey takes Leonardo DiCaprio for lunch and says, no one knows if a stock's going to go up, down, sideways. And like, yeah. Completely. And so I, even even though we look at stuff like these facts, you know, these the low percentages, the old games, but the, actually the, I think there is there is some reason to look at this and go, no, do you know what? People found some games and some some services that they are they truly love taking time to spend in, and the fact they're still playing them six years on, and that they're spending ninety two percent of their time in these and other areas as opposed to like new games you're not controlled you're just playing what you want to play and that's where you're putting your time and they would love it if you played their new stuff and that they stole all your money but they're not so they're don't, not. don't get me wrong we're wasting all of our time by doing all this stuff but at least they're not telling but us what to play there is still hashtag say it jensie hashtag scope for hope that's scope for hope baby um well, uh, what a, do you know what? That, that's a slightly more positive note to end things on than, uh, than the road I was leading us down. So thank you for that, Jonesy. And thank you for being such a, an excellent um, partner in crime on another episode of the Super Show podcast. It's been delightful chatting video games with you. Uh, thank you for hosting, mate. A stellar job, as always. And thank you to everyone for uh, joining us in the chat. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed your uh, your comments and your quips and you're calling me out for the utter drivel that I talk half the time, but I uh, appreciate it. <laughs> you're a very brave man reading the chat while you podcast live. It would hurt my ego too much. But yes, uh, shout out to everyone who's in the chat. Shout out to everyone who super chatted. Shout out to Magni. Happy birthday. Um, and yeah, a big thank you and a shout out to you if you're watching or listening to this after the fact on YouTube or on a podcasting platform. We hope you had as good a time as we did um and we look forward to seeing you again next week where there is going to be even more gaming goodness to break down and to chat about and to argue about and to any verb you fancy we've got it um um so thanks again 